and uh, and Daniel Radcliffe as well, who's uh, obviously like Harry Potter. Especially when you're filming Dot Martin, because um, there's so many fans of the show. I mean, you know, it's been going for years. I think I've been working on it now for a decade. The first time I knocked on the door, he literally opened the door and he had his dressing gown. He just went, "Good morning." All right, mate, how you doing? The next one goes, fuck off! Jules, how are you, brother? Very good, mate. I feel I actually feel like I'm saying hello to a real Viking. Have, have, have you, do you know your ancestry? Yeah, I mean, it, it kind of goes back that way. Um, so I've, I've got... Um, some Scottish and Irish. So I'm assuming that with, uh, with the Scottish ancestry, it's, uh, it, it, it came from that because, uh, you know, everywhere up in, uh, you know, Northumbria obviously got, um, raided. Got raided and I'm probably a, a product of that, which I'm, I'm happy to, you know, but he, yeah. he says whilst drinking out of Thor's hammer as a, as a cup of tea. <laughs> well, funnily enough, you're talking to a Viking too. Oh, awesome. Yeah. So it's, it's those blue eyes. Well, thrall means serf or, or yeah. slave. We, 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 we made up the lower caste of the Viking culture. Oh. Well, so, Seager, Seager means man of the sea. Oh, wow. So, which is, uh, you know, also uh, Viking if you want to, if you want to look at it that way. So that's the direct uh, interpretation of that name. So, so that, that's cool. Yes, and um, they were good at the old seafaring, weren't they? They had methods that we probably don't even un- methods of navigation that we don't even understand today. Yeah, yeah, and the ship's pretty cool as well. So that was one of the good things about filming Vikings was that I actually got to row properly. You know, so it was like you know, it was, um, being on a, a real Viking longship was a, was a pretty amazing. Yes, and um. Okay, question then, because I watched the documentary. So the Vikings, they're there. They obviously have the sail up when when they when they've got a wind, of, as as say, good sailors always do. But when there's no wind, then they get on the oars, don't they? And they will yeah. they will row across the North Sea. Um, I heard that everyone they sit on a chest and they can have their personal possessions or you know weapons in the chest. That's correct. Yeah, and. When it's time to sleep, they just lie down on the deck and sleep. Yeah, that's it. There's no room for anything else. So there's no room for luxuries. I mean, what what the chest would be covered in, like a big sheep's skin, you know, uh, or something like, you know, a big fur, and that would be your bed and your blanket. So th- that would be it. And if it, if, it, if it was wet, you slept with a wet blanket, you know. So and I can't imagine there was much room in those chests because there's no room on board, really. They're, they're not as big as you as you think they are, they're, you know, and that's why they were so adaptable because they could they could move about and they could go down rivers and you know stuff like that. So you know, and maneuverable. And when they got to a to a you know like a waterfall or rapids, that they they pick the boat up, and put it on their shoulders, and carry it, wouldn't they? I'm not sure whether that is historically correct. I'd have to I'd have to check that, but that would be pretty cool if it did. So well, I know well, that. They showed it in uh, Vikings with Floki using uh, winches and stuff like that. So, but yeah, I've I I did you know the bit where they're they're pulling them across logs. I know I know they've done that. So, but yeah, picking them up, oh, I'm not too sure about that. Depends on yeah. the size of the crew. <laughs> so, you're in. Well, we were just discussing this earlier, weren't we? Vikings Valhalla. Yeah, that's a new one. It comes out um, 2022 now, which is a shame. Because I think that's uh, delayed by COVID. Yeah. So, not, uh, so I think they were they were aiming for um, like winter 2021, but uh, it's it's looking at 2022 now. So, but hopefully they'll crack on and uh, you know and, and and get it out there. Is that the same production company that made Vikings? Yeah, hundred percent. So yeah. it's it's the same same director. Um, the 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 writer of um, Die Hard, Jeb Stewart, which is 
um, pretty cool. So a lot of kudos there. So um, uh, anyone that can write the, the best Christmas movie of all time is, uh, is, is all right on my books. And wh- which one is that? The writer of Die Hard. So he, oh, so, right. sorry. Yeah. Die Hard. Yes, with um, Bruce Willis. Is it? That's right. Yeah. God, memory gets a bit hazy, doesn't it? With, when, when you look back and think Die Hard, what, that came out, what? Bloody... Uh, almost 30 years ago? Uh, oh, certainly yeah, I, I guess I'd go with... Oh, my God. Right, OK. So this would be really bad at, at pub quiz right now, wouldn't I? Well, we both would. So let's have a look. Die Hard. That must have been, what, 88, 89 maybe? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I've got my phone right here. You've got your computer, we're both, but we're both using it. So we could we could cheat and look it up. Yeah. We, I, I, that'll I, be it now. That'll be the subject of the podcast. That, 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 that yeah, people we'll will just about, be correcting we'll talk, us. We'll all talk about Bruce, Bruce Willis in, in, instead of Jules. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. It's done by me. It's a long time for talking. I don't think my uh, longevity as a podcast host would be that. <laughs> you know, I don't think I'd get any more guests. But hey, let's what? talk about Penitent because you played Vladimir Berbatov. Uh, Barbatov. Barbatov. Oh, but that was close. There we go. And <laughs> I, um, I was uh, deeply honoured to be able to be invited to the red carpet opening. Of Penitent by, by Mar- Martin Webster, um, the wonderful producer. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Die Hard, nineteen eighty-eight. I was spot on the money. <laughs> oh my God, that was before I was born. Oh my. <laughs> so yeah, that, that wasn't a bad joke. So I'm still all right with the uh, with the pub quiz lot then. Yeah, so I'm happy now. <laughs> and I haven't ruined your podcast. And we'll. <laughs> Well, we'll come on on to the pub quiz because that featured in Fisherman's Friends, didn't it? Oh yeah, it did. God, and yeah. um, another. Ah, oh, love love that film. Absolutely loved it. And of course, it's not far from us. The film down in Cornwall. Um, I can. I, we'll 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 come on to that. But um, yes. Yeah, so penitent. I'm, I'm just trying to get it straight in my aging memory were you one of the guys that that shot the soldiers outside of the yeah 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 Yeah. so so i I played i played um general barbatov so and uh yeah he's a a bit of a nasty guy like you know he's responsible for all the ethnic ethnic cleansing and stuff like that so and uh yeah so i the i shot the uh civilians in the first scenes and then uh, this is massive spoilers, here, isn't it? And then I wasn't very nice to the uh, the NATO forces, the United Nations forces. So, um, and I tell you what, Jules, right? Something changed in me when I become a father, right? I guess it does all of us. Yeah, me too. That scene with the little oh god, I'm just getting upset thinking about it. To think that that really went on. Yeah, yeah. That 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 that's that particular scene. Um, stayed with me for longer than most scenes because it it involved a, a child. Um, yeah. I think uh, that that stuck with me for like two or three weeks. It was horrible. Yeah. Um, for friends so, yeah. at home, in case you're wondering, the, the the child has to watch his father get shot dead, and and then he's just crying on his corpse, and it was just oh gosh. But you know, Hollywood tends to hide these realities from us, don't they? And it's. It's Ma- Martin uh, Martin Webster doesn't. No, so, which is why we like working together. We like to uh, just uh, get the stuff out there. And the thing is, war is brutal, you know. And uh, the the film is a, is about PTSD, so it wouldn't have made any sense or had any impact unless you know we'd we'd actually shown the brutality of war and the, re- the reality of war. You know, um, far worse things happen in war than what I you know. Uh, did as it as an actor in those scenes um although, so it, we just wanted to affect people and get the audience on our side and make them hate me which is um which is interesting and it also make the characters hate me and give them a reason to have uh, ptsd but it, also, it but it stuck with me as a person for a, a long time afterwards i was i was having nightmares for like at least two or three weeks 
after doing that scene. I don't yeah. think um, it was as brutal in the film as it was when we filmed it. Because when we filmed it, we actually had a squib, which is a, a, a miniature explosive device with filled with blood. So, and it, it, it literally sh shoots out everywhere. So, so when I pulled the trigger, bang, um, it actually, ex a squib went off. So in my head, even though you know you're an actor and you know you're still firing, uh, you know, a blank firing pistol and everything else, as, as an actor, there's still part of your brain where you're pointing a gun at someone, pulling the trigger, and then the next thing, a huge gout of blood explodes from out of the, their back. You know, so I couldn't avoid my brain trying to make reality of that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I, that, so that was, that was, that's what stayed with me is the fact that I still did the actions and saw the reaction. So it's a really weird thing because I've done lots and lots of um, fight scenes in films. I've, I've killed people, been killed myself. You know, it's um, nothing really stayed with me. I suppose that this is one of the first ones that had involved um, a child, you know, so. Yeah. I, yeah, couldn't so that, that... I couldn't, what, I couldn't, I just, look, I'm not afraid of anything. I think my history shows that, but yeah, I watched it the first time on, you know, on, on, on the computer after I think Martin sent me a copy and then at the premiere, I just looked down at the ground. I, I, it's just too awful. Um, yeah. Oh gosh. No, no, I'm not. No, I mean, I'm not saying the film was awful. I'm just saying that I just. No, no, no. I'm, I'm with you. I don't need to watch this again. And I just looked down for a minute until it was over. And then I looked, looked, yeah. looked back up. I'm glad. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of glad they left the, the blood out in a way. But I think, it, no, I, I, I don't know. I would like to see an edit with with that back in because that was the shocking thing for me is seeing that visual side of it of the you know, but it kind of it it cut it cuts before the blood so, um, which still has impact and doesn't make it um, you know, like some films films are gory for the sake of the gore, yeah. So and I'm glad that you're saying it still had the same amount of impact without oh, the blood. Gosh. You know? There was a bit as well. I noticed the second time that I didn't. Did I remember right? In in when I watched it at the premiere, when these guys are, are being executed, these um, friends at home there are UN peacekeepers basically, and the, the film is set in Bosnia during the troubles. Mm. Um, was it also that the the young boy was then running across the cornfield? Yeah. So he had like a double helping of. Traumatic. Yeah. So, well, how uh, Barbatov works is whenever he commits any kind of atrocities, he always leaves a witness because he wants to create him his own urban legend. You know, so yeah. he wants he wants the people to fear him. So, without uh, a witness to something that he's done that's really bad, who's to fit? Who, who you know? How how is that 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 myth meant to then perpetuate? You know, so. So he always leaves somebody alive, you know, and kind of um, enjoys that fact that he's going he's gonna to leave somebody alive. Mm. And, uh, you know, so his, his men are like dogs. They want to they wanna just kill everything. But um, he's the I, logical one. He's the dangerous one. I think that's kind of an old military tactic, isn't it? You leave someone alive to go back to their troop and go, oh, my God, you don't, you don't believe what's just happened sort of thing. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of old school as well. Um, for me, growing up, I think. <laughs> like, so, if if um, you know, because I I had an interesting um, experience growing up, where I, I grew up in a really rough area, and uh, and if if you weren't on your toes, then uh, you, you know you you got put on your ass basically. So whenever um, something occurred, you'd want as many people to witness it as possible as a form of defense, like, uh, you know, for yourself. So it's like, <laughs> so, you, you know, you want as many people to, to witness it so that you didn't then get picked on or whatever mm -hmm. afterwards. So, so that, that, that was interesting. So, yeah, I've got, I draw on with, with the more brutal characters, I, I drew on a, a, a lot of my um, personal experiences, you know, yeah. so, because I've, I've had a, a colorful life. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, feel free to tell. I mean, I always say to my guests, you know, although it's I love these chats, but essentially it's for the people watching at home that that they never, you know, I get a lot because I'm ex-military. I get a lot of military guests, and and they lean towards the humble, if you know what I mean. And you know, I won't tell them that. And it's like, no, it's the other way around. It's just just if you've got stuff that people won't have experienced, um, it's fascinating to hear. Well, co- colourful's enough yeah. word to use. For, for well, my... what, are, you, are you able to say what part of the country you could... I, ca- I can't picture your accent. Oh, I, I, um, I grew up in Kent and South London, but then I've, I've moved to the West Country um, in my 20s, and I'm, I'm now in Cornwall. And I suppose that working in this industry, you kind of... Um, you want to lose the the guttural side of, of um, your native accent. So although I still sound like I'm from Kent or like, you know, I sound like I'm from London, I, I don't sound like, um, you know, when I go back um, to my, my hometown or seeing my friends or anything, I'll go back to London. They will call me a carrot cruncher because, my, my, you know, I don't notice it. That how much my accent has changed, but um, it, it has. This is my posh voice now. <laughs> it's like, it's like, I'm in. I'm in the same boat. I, I was born in Kent, South East London. Yeah. Um, and then I moved to the West Country, but I was about six when we moved down here. I was, my, no, my, I might actually have been five. And then there was this weird thing that when we started to become hairy teenagers uh, uh, when we're at comprehensive all these kind of lads you'd grown up with started to take on this weird accent yeah Yeah, right but yeah get on in it yeah (laughs) yeah and i just listened to him and thought fucking i don't ever want to speak like that (laughs) so no but i will say having lived in the southwest now for you know best part of well on i've lived I, I, there was one point in my life i'd lived most of it abroad funny enough um but now i think i've lived most of it in in the southwest and there is just a natural tendency to pick up on the local accent not that i'm saying anything wrong with that but people say to me god you sound like so janna <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm a sponge for accents i find it fascinating so and a lot of the time um i think if I'm if I'm out and I'm meeting a lot of people, new people, and I find something they've just said like really quite quaint or just uh, intriguing or just it tweaks my ear bone, I'll end up repeating it or whatever. So people think I'm taking the Mickey out of them, but I'm not. I'm genuinely fascinated by the fact that they pronounce words different, you know. So <clears throat> and depending on, on where they come from. Um, my my ear listens and I try and retain it because I never know whether I'm going to play somebody that you know comes from whatever country they're from, you know. So um, you know I've been doing a lot of uh, American and um, dialects and, and stuff like that. But so I'm I'm fascinated by the you know they the way they change their words and stuff like that. But even regionally as well, um, here in this country we change so many words, and uh, you know from Kent. Uh, the, the Kentish twang is, is quite kind of cockney, but they speak really fast. So they'll put, they'll say four words in the space of like, you know, one word. So, <laughs> yes. you know, it, but it's a bit, it's a bit like down here. But, so when I first moved down and people would be like saying, what was, what was some of the phrases that threw me? Um, like moving from South London to here threw me anyway, because people were saying good morning to me. And I was like, is this P- PG or am I, am I swearing in this? What's, what's the hey, deal? Whatever, as it comes, it's fine. So, so when I first moved down, I remember like, you know, people saying good morning to me and I was like, what the fuck? Who, who's that? I don't know you. It's just really weird. And now I'm one of them going, morning, morning, all right? Like to complete strangers, it's, it's really funny. So it's funny when you take it back home. You, so you go, you know, you go back to Kent. And uh, so... Um, I've still got family in the Medway towns, which uh, I, that's a colourful area. Um, so that's resp- partly responsible for my colourful past. 
And uh, so you're if you're walking home from you know being out or whatever, like one a.m., you'll get one like really uh, happy medway eye walking home or staggering, and uh, and as you're walking past it, but oh, hey, mate, you having a good night and all that? Like, yeah, where, where you been? Blah blah, and then you're like, oh yeah, yeah, just be lucky, and then uh, you part ways, <clears throat> and then uh, yeah, the next bloke that walks past because I've now adopted this West country attitude that where I say hello to everyone. Uh, so the next place that walks past, I, I'm in that boat where I've just had um, a little, a little conflab with a, uh, with a guy really friendly, like a little bit drunk like me. And I'm like, all right, mate, how you doing? And the next bloke goes, fuck off. <laughs> like, you know, and then, and then literally wants to fight you. It's so, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's funny. I've kind of lost a bit of my street wiseness, I think. And uh, oh. but I'm a little, little bit, more, bit more innocent since moving to uh, the West Country because everyone's everyone's just um, they're not guarded as much, you know, as they are in, in big cities and stuff. Yeah, well, I live in the city, so I, I I have to be honest, I have to fight my temper sometimes when I'm out running. Yeah. And it's the morning, so there's not many people around. So there's someone at six, you know, seven o'clock, say, walking to work and you come up and you're like, and they're just like that, and you, and it, it 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 you know this is the example that, that that's been set for the next generation. You know, no no community, no love, no empathy, no hey uh, you know morning. And it's it's not everybody, of course, it's not, but it but it is a lot of people now. Yeah, that's why I, I, I choose to live rural, um, so that I know my neighbours, you know, and stuff like that. It's, it, and there, I do like that sense of community. So I don't think I'd live in a city again. Um, I'm happy to work in them. And, you know, I enjoy visiting different cities and stuff like that. But, you know, now I've, now I've lived in the country um, for, for quite a few years. I, I don't think I could ever change. It's like um, I, I like knowing the people that I'm, I'm going to see. It went, you know, being able to say hello to him and have a conversation and stuff, and but uh, but the downside to living where I live is you get you get a lot of tourists. So in the summer, you, especially with uh, COVID, all the all the locals are just playing hide from the tourists. So you, oh, you're basically, I, I, yeah, I'm familiar with it all. You know, um, let's not go on about that. But yeah, I mean we we couldn't book anywhere. Well, obviously, no one could go abroad, so that was a yeah. no no goer. Um, I don't know if I'll ever be allowed abroad again. Actually, I've already been kicked off one uh, expedition that I should literally be on as we speak in uh, the Sahara. Right. Um, for for can we say you know for exercising my freedom to choose. Right. Um, but so we ended up camping in Cornwall for a week which yeah. is I have no problem with that except the zip on our tent bust on the first days to that yeah, added, yeah. Uh, um and yeah oh my god yes everyone like you know doing certain things in shops down there even though this was after the you know after you had and and yeah like I get it I I I, I get it well what I wanted to ask you is one thing I love, not so much when you hear a professional, um, um, go, um, I've forgotten what, what's it when you copy people's voices? What's that? When you emulate. Yeah, no, the artist, you know, the, the almost like the comedian go on stage and they'll be. Oh, uh, oh yeah. <laughs> We've both had a senior moment. So, yeah. um, like, was it Michael Howard? Um, R- Mike Yarwood, wasn't it? Used to be brilliant. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Impressionist. There Impressionist, yes. Also a painter. When you see the professional or, or you know the entertainers on telly, it, it's it's fascinating. But for me, it's when your mate does it and he's got yeah. it brilliantly, and you're like, yes. And, you, and, and obviously, in your business, you have to be able to take on accents, and um, you know. I'm I'm not I'm not one of, I'm happy with accents, but I tend to um I tend to have like you know do them when I'm in the shoot or in the in that mode. So <clears throat> they're all still there, 
but I don't tend to like be able to just pull them out my pocket like for to to do an impression of of someone etc cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, because I'm kind of a method in character actor, um, I just I find an accent for for that individual character that I'm playing, and then just keep hold of it. And then I tend to store them away afterwards. I just forget about them. So it's like, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not, I get asked, oh, do this accent, do that accent. And it's like, uh, I've got, I, I don't, it's not how I work. So it, it's weird. So I can, you know, I can learn an accent in a day. Um, so I had to do Northern Irish for, um, for an audition. And I'd, I'd never done it, but it's like that typical actor thing where, you think, well, I'm good at accents, so I'll, I can do a general Irish, but I hadn't done Northern Irish, so I, I'll write it down and, and then then ended up in front of a casting director and I had 24 hours and I was like, oh, shit, I've got to learn Northern Irish in 24 hours. So so I, I started working on that and I actually really enjoyed it, really enjoyed it. It's, it's a great accent to do. So, um, so I went to the audition and then I turned up and to my horror, the casting director was Irish. Um, I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, what do I do now? So it was, um, it was a weird one. So I, I did, it's one of the only times I asked for feedback on the accent because um, I'd learned it in 24 hours that she was Irish. And, uh, and she said, oh, you sounded like a, late, a native. It was no problem at all. Mm. So Can and, you give uh, us a, are you, are you up for giving us a demo? No, that's the thing. I don't do the I don't do the demos. It's like you know, it's, it's like I, I'd have to, uh, yeah, I'd have I'd have to um, revisit. I'm... So I, I do a little Cornish, but the thing is, with the Cornish stuff, um, it's not as you hear it. It's as you described it earlier, like the kids in school. Most it's like a faux Cornish, you know. So mm. um, because I, I was in Doc Martin and Poldark and things like that, and, and Fisherman's Friends that all filmed down here so um and that, that that's funny because when you go i've been up for when i did the script read for poldark so so i was sat at the, the table with all of the actors and we were reading episodes one and two of poldark i think so it was pretty cool to be sat around a, a table with um some acting royalty and uh so i was quite excited because the scripts were like this like you know episode one and two it's like quite a few hours of dialogue and, and and it's really enjoyable to to um put um faces to the dialogue God, and yeah. uh and i was thinking oh some people are using accents some people aren't and i and i was like no i'm i'm definitely going cornish for this you know so so i, I did my accent and I, I had a nice compliment afterwards uh because um a couple of the actors came up and said oh so you're the you're the proper cornish man then like, and I was like, no, no, I was born in Kent and grew up in South London. You know, so but I, was, I was like, but thanks. Good compliment. You know, so, but, I, you know, I, I tend to, to learn and forget. And then I, I store them away in a memory box somewhere. And then once I get another character on the pages of dialogue, that's when it will click back on again. Here we go. Right, back in the room. So tell us then, because this, <laughs> this is the stuff that fascinates me. And, and I should say for our friends at home, Jules and I are going to be starring together in a film. Okay, I'm, I'm, I might have a bit part, but <laughs> I, man, it's all good. It's I'm going to, I'm going to dine out on it. Believe me. Um, but before we come on to that, how is it? How, how is how do you find it learning lines? And when you're delivering them on set, is there kind of a leeway if if <laughs> if you get a, a word wrong and, or does the director jump in and go, no, you, you should have said this or, or do it all, it all depends on the shoot. <clears throat> um, so, so learning lines, well, I'll, I'll do them in order. So learning lines is just a life skill. It's just something that, um, you just do, you know, it just, um, it's like anything like, you know, you were in the military that there, there would have been things that, you would have learned where you'd have first looked at it and thought, God, I'm never going to be able to do that. And then you can put a sack on your head and, uh, you know, and, and do it in 30 seconds, you know, uh, and <laughs> that sounds really bad. 
<laughs> I'm talking about dismantling and putting together weapons, you know. Yeah. So that was that was what was in my head from from my uh, ex- own experiences, you know, is is the the blind uh, dismantling and putting back putting the stuff together again. Learning lines was like that for me. It's just like first of all, it was intimidating, especially when you get um, pages and pages of dialogue, you know. But but everything is shot in blocks, so you don't have to learn the whole um, script. It's nice to to know the whole script and and read through it and become familiar with it um, from a performance perspective with your character work, so that you know um, how you're going to feel at certain times. But and uh, you know. The, the the subtleties and nuances you can kind of put in there or start thinking about but learning lines was tough and has become easier over the years but i'm sure that as my years advance it's going to become tougher again because i've i've heard that you know from some of the older actors um that they've had to use different techniques because they just can't retain it in their memory like they used to so um they've had like earplugs in or stuff you know stuff like that with people saying the lines to them before they deliver it but um you know i'm talking i'm talking people of uh, advanced years that are, that are still doing a, a bloody good job uh, and, it, and it was interesting to find out what techniques they had because when you watch them performing after you i'm not going to say any names because um you know this was a, a private conversation with uh, somebody that i was working with but when you watch them performing you can't you can't see it so as long as they're still delivering their job and doing their job and they're capable of doing their job, no matter how what techniques they're using to achieve that storytelling mode. So what is like, you know, yeah. so, so, but uh, yeah. So I'm probably at the peak of learning lines now. I don't have a problem with it. But the next thing is the, the downward decline where I'm, you know, having to write them on my hand or something. You know, so, so if yeah, you ever see me acting or doing that, you'll know what I'm doing, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. That, that, that was the... um I don't want to say shame, but that was a sort of downfall of Parkinson, wasn't it? it? Was you could see when he couldn't remember his questions, and he and there was obviously a screen that they put on the yeah. floor. So every time he, you know, his guest is speaking, he's he's looking down like that to read the next question. And yeah, yes, yeah. There's a lot of that you can get. You can get stuff like you know I can't remember what they're called actually because I, I don't use them, but where the words just scroll up and and stuff. So there's there's bits and pieces, but obviously. Um, that's not what uh, most filmmakers would like or, or need. But if, if somebody's got so much kudos, like uh, in the industry, then um, you know, directors and filmmakers will just put up with anything to employ them because there's a uh, you know there's a there's a lot of um, yeah a lot of different egos in in the film industry and, and stuff like that and a lot of different type behavior types you know. Mm. I uh, I tend to try and behave myself, so, but um, but I I also engage my mouth before my brain sometimes, so I have to I have to I have to watch myself as well. So, but and it, when it comes down to um, the strictness of the script or the tightness of it, some uh, filmmakers really like it <clears throat> when you they they will give you um, freedom to play with the character you know, because you end up knowing the character more than they do because it, originally the writers have, have written, um, some some people write something that they would describe as a guide to the character and they're happy with the actor then going on to embellish, mm. you know, which I, which is what I like to do with some of the, the badder type characters, you know, the, the nasty guys, because... Um, I'm I'm quite method as well, so I tend to let a little bit of that character inhabit me, and I enjoy doing that. Um, apart from when it gives me PTSD, <laughs> so that's the danger of that, I suppose. Um, like when you end up taking your work home with you and you didn't really mean to. So, um, but some of them are so strict they have um, a script supervisor who we literally, or most of them, do have a script supervisor. They'll analyze every word. And it'll, it won't be the director if you've messed up on one tiny word. It'll be the script supervisor that comes over and just whispers in your ear. Or it, depending on the script supervisor, a nice one will come and whisper in your ear. So one that's not so, um, 
what's what's the word? Sense, it doesn't have as good sensitive. bedside manner. We'll shout it across the studio <laughs> at you, and you, so you're like, "What? Oh, thanks!" In front of everyone, <laughs> it's like you know, it's like, "Yeah, George, you fucked up again." So, um, but I think uh, my favourite is somewhere in between. I like to know that they've got my back, the script supervisors, but also like to, um, and I don't do this often, but if you've got, if if you're in um, that mode and you, you know, you really know your character, you really know how you want to portray him and, and the director and writers are happy with your portrayal of that. There's sometimes in a scene where you're like, oh, what character wouldn't, wouldn't do that. He wouldn't put up with that. He wouldn't be stood there silent. So, um, and it's really nice when you can say to a writer, you know, and as long as you're not being a twat and doing it all the time, you know, trying to change every scene, it's like, but just occasionally there'll be something where you're like, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Yeah. Or I wouldn't say that. Or I would be saying something right now. Or that would make me feel this way. So I'd react in that way. And it is, it is nice to have that um, flexibility to be able to just have a qu quiet word with the, the writer and director and say, oh, look, do you know what? I, there's no way that this guy with the temper that he's got would stand there and take that without actually getting back in their face or doing something. And, uh, and it's, yeah. it's nice to have um, the backup of, uh, of people, you know, because... It's, it's a bit scary to say that as an actor sometimes to especially with a big director and a big writer because uh, you don't want you to you don't want to um, stick out and be known as oh that that guy is always trying to like you know change my my writing and shit like that you know because some writers are really precious of their stuff but I'm all about the story that's that's all I care about it's got nothing to do with giving me a few extra seconds or minutes on camera like or writing an extra scene just for me or all, any of that crap it's just it's the story. So, um, and that's how I work. You know, it's, it's like, you know, I want to create the most believable story with the, the bunch of people that I'm working with. And that, that's all it's about. I don't want anything to drag people out of that story. I want to, you know, create something kind of compelling and stuff like that. So, so yeah, it is super strict sometimes and other times it's completely flexible. Mm. Like working with Martin uh, Webster, is um, he's completely flexible. He he knows what my skill set is, and he'll he'll write um, fantastic little bits and pieces for me. And then uh, he'll be like, but he he likes what what I do. So you know, for instance, there's a there's a continuity piece that is like almost like an Easter egg, but um, because the in penitent because there uh, there's not a lot of blood shown. Uh, my character smokes cigarettes and if you notice like whenever he's smoking a cigarette he's he's rolling up a cigarette and whenever he does something nasty or he's about to do something nasty he's smoking a cigarette and then there's one scene where as I'm rolling up there's blood all over my hands so I'm smoking a, a white and red roll up you know that is stained with the blood of someone who's just killed it's just uh, little God. things like that. that that was me and I just like the contrast of the red and white and that that you know the fact that he's got blood on his hands so um so yeah that's and and then martin picked up on that of the the cigarette piece because when someone was waiting to go into a meeting one of the other characters he sparked up a cigarette and i i knew it was because of me smoking and i was like that that would have been because he he filmed that when i wasn't there mm -hmm. and uh and i like i really like that because he picked up on my you know idea and then mirrored it i like i like mirroring in in movies so um you know things you know characters mirroring or, or a storyline mirroring or you know an action and reaction and stuff like that and, and little 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 easter eggs in in films that are, you know you might only pick up on a second or third time or you might not pick up at all but uh but yeah i like the subtle nuances of of, of movie making so. Oh, my favourite is the is the scene changes in um, Highlander, where one minute he's in the lake and it, and it goes down underwater, and then it, <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, it, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I remembered that vividly. I was worried then because I've watched it for a, year, a long time, but uh, yeah, I love that movie. 
Right. Yeah. And it cuts to his apartment in New York and it's the fit and he comes up in it and it's the fish tank. Yeah. And it's got, it's just so, so clever. No, it's bloody clever stuff. Like, I, I want to watch it again now. So I had a huge poster on my wall of a Highlander. So um, I've got, uh, I think, uh, I think I've got some past life experiences like, uh, that I can draw on as well. <laughs> so. Yes. How is it then when you, film scenes out of the time sequence is 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 that just something as a professional you just you just do it because you're acting or do, yeah. is it nice to do them in sequence um it is lovely to do them in sequence but you don't often get that um that luxury um so yeah it does it does weird you out because you have to be like it's not it's not a fact i think for me personally it's it's how i felt at that particular point so it's all about feeling it's like right what's happened if i'm if i'm filming a scene you know like two episodes in the future it's like right how am i going to feel what's happened and that but but you also have to look at all the other cast members especially on a, a you know a thing with lots of characters and go right how does he feel about that person that person that person that person so that you you know you've got that that continuity of emotion still there and i think that's that's the thing that's most difficult so um i don't know i don't know how other people deal with it because i'm not other people but um i maybe i'm overthinking but because i'm so uh, respectful of the story i just want to make sure that i'm reacting to everybody correctly based on the timeline you know of, of where it's at so i could close my curtains so that you could see, so I'm not. Yeah, you might want to draw. You might want to draw them a bit. Um, but they're all, they're appalling. <laughs> I won't, I, we don't care about that. We draw our strength from the universe on this podcast, and not there not the go, curtains. Yeah. Oh, that was a that was a. There we go. A gratuitous, a gratuitous yeah. arse shot of You've me. Gone, so your your hair's yeah. gone a, a deeper shade of of red now. Yeah, proper yeah, proper yeah. Viking. A bit pro So mm -hmm. um yeah, on the subject of films, what what's been your inspiration? What one what 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 are your favorite films? Oh my god, I like um I'm very much into the Coen Brothers movies. Um and I'm very much into like Tarantino-esque stuff, you know. Um I like complex characters. So, and looking like I do, I, I play, I am a character actor. So I've kept this look now for 12 years because I don't get boring jobs. I don't get the office worker job, you know, and stuff, stuff like that. So I, I get, I get, you know, much more fun stuff. So um, I really love like stuff like Fargo the movie and the, and the series. Mm. Um, oh, Brother, Where Art Thou is absolutely fantastic. So, you know, um, obviously uh, Pulp Fiction and stuff like that. <clears throat> Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, absolutely phenomenal. So I like, yeah, I like, I like complex characters and I like, um, I like really, really clever um, dialogues, you know, so, and yeah, yeah, so... The, yeah, yeah. Res Reservoir Dogs had a good dialogue, didn't it? Oh, it's fantastic. I went to the cinema to watch that. So yeah. I, I remember it vividly. Like, I think that was one of the first movies that I saw um, when I when I moved to Devon. So I went out to Exeter and it was like a proper day out. Yeah. Because you know, living on, on the south coast. And it was it's like one of the times where you, uh, you didn't get ten tend to go to the cinema much. You know, so when you did, it was a, it was a thing. You know, so it's like, you know, we, I think we we were taking things like that for, for granted um, pre, you know, two years ago. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, you know, because it's because uh, it's all there. But I haven't been to the cinema in such a long time, apart from watching uh, film premieres and, and stuff like that. But that's a much more smaller, intimate mm. uh, thing. You know, can I tell you so, my Reservoir Dog story? Go on then. It's a short one. Um, You've still got two ears, so I'm assuming you're all right. Yes. <laughs> at this moment in time. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I rocked up at the cinema uh, back when it came out, 
and and we're all going to watch i don't know it's something like lassie the movie or something really really benign um might have been superman or something right and the queue was around the block yeah. and then then the um cinema attendant came out and went sorry folks cinema's full um we've got reservoir Re this new film reservoir dogs showing if anyone's in so the whole queue went into reservoir dogs thinking you know they're all set up for watching i don't know bambi or some what, what, what whatever it was i kind of would have loved that mm. like but i didn't know anything about reservoir dogs or tarantino at the time so i i'm someone that doesn't i don't i don't like watching movie trailers i like just going in fresh so that would have been that would have been totally my thing. I yeah, would have absolutely loved but it. I tell you, Jules, you've never seen so many people stand up and walk out of the cinema in your life, <laughs> <laughs> especially when he starts cutting his ear off. Everyone's like, "This ain't Bambi." <laughs> oh man, it's a, I've been desensitized. I think um, I think we all have because stuff has got gorier and gorier and gorier, and everyone just sits through it. You know, it's like um, take um, Walking Dead for instance. You know. It's like we're, we're watching bodies getting torn in half and like guts exploding everywhere. That would have made me want to puke when I was a teenager, you know, but now we're, I'll just, I can, I can eat my, eat my dinner whilst watching it, you know, and not, not be bothered. So I've gone the other way, funny enough, because I'm, I'm getting quite spiritual in my old age and my body physically reacts differently to that stuff now. Right. Like I can't, yeah. I, I, I choose not to watch horrors because I just think, there's so much like lovely stuff to, you know, I'm not, I'm not, it's not that I'm soft or anything. It's just, um, I, I don't want to see children getting out and you know, I mean, yeah, yeah. I just, it depends on the, on the subject, you know, yeah. Matter, you know, I mean, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm with you on that one. It's, it's so. just funny. It's just some, something's like changed inside me. And that's sort of indifferent in, in penitent because it was part of the, you know, the whole film hinged on on a scene like that, didn't it? Yeah. But when it's just a film that's just dedicated to being nasty, I'm just like, man, but I'm a bit done with all that stuff now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I like I like dialogue driven stuff. You know, it's uh, it's like there is a lot of violence in the in the movies that I that I watch, but it's it's based around dialogue and the, and the violence is necessary. It's not it's not gratuitous. Yeah. So. You know, it's like, but yeah, me putting together a list of films would be would be tricky, you know, because I, I, I like so much, you know. But I do like I do like time periods as well. I very much like that late eighties time period, you know. So you know, with with, with stuff like that, with like Highland um, and Blade Runner and and things like that. So first blood, first blood. Yeah! Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Probably one of my favourite. I like First Blood. I, I like the film The Beach because I absolutely loved the book. And I was yeah, that's a fantastic traveling, movie. Traveling in Thailand at the time. What one question I've always wanted to ask in the original Vikings with um, Travis Fimmel, obviously. Yeah. Why did they adopt the accent that they? Did? I mean, I've lived in Scandinavia for four years, and um, obviously, diff, you know, there's different time period, but. Um, when they speak in English, like "oh, hello," you know, doo -doo -doo -doo, it's like this dancey, like the the like the, the, yeah. the, the the scientists on the Muppet Show. But the Travis Fimmel adopted it was a it was genius. This real like, and he's moving his eyes. He's got these really sort of what we call in the Marine scary eyes. Um, was there any reason for were they trying to be period or did they just go with this slightly different version of the of a Norsk accent? Um, I think because the cast are international, so you've got um, you know lots of different people from lots of different countries. So I think they may have adopted a, a faux Scandi accent so that everybody could do it yeah so and maybe the only people that were insulted were people from those native countries having to do a faux version of their own accent you know so but then that's like you know if you're from 
the areas where we were born, you know, doing like over the top Cockney. Yeah, you know? of course. So, um, and I think also um, what happens with the American market is the, uh, the <laughs> they want everything to be understandable in, in the state. So, so they might have just made, made the uh, accent a little bit um, softer so they could be understood to, to you know, uh, the USA and, and non-English speakers, you know, so which, which might have struggled with that accent. But, I, I mean, personally, I love the accent in, um, oh, God, the, the Norseman. Have you seen that? The, I have. That stars... Um... Oh, no, no, the TV series, the comedy. Oh, OK, I'm sorry. I thought you meant that film and it had the star from that football um, hooligan film that was it green 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 street yeah green was it green street um oh yeah. uh, a really really good actor i've been chat i was actually chatting with him on twitter at one stage Le leave art no oh, i can't remember P apologies but uh, it will come to me yes yeah we'll have to uh, google it now yeah but no he did a film called i'm pretty sure it's called the norseman and he had a starring role in it um i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna you need to watch you need to watch the uh the the, the comedy stuff norseman it's, it's it's on netflix it's really funny i'm, I'm gonna write it down that, yeah it's not child friendly at all oh, okay <laughs> and what about um what, but you'll like their accents. It's very sing-songy. So, I guess Green Street's not coming up for some reason. It was called it was Green something Street. hooligans, wasn't it? Green, yeah, yeah. But that's a later one, two thousand nine. Ah. This was the one. It starred Matey, who got allegedly got out of the industry because he said the. Well, let's just say he thought there's some kiddie stuff in in in. in we're talking Hollywood now. In, in, yeah. Um, what's the chap's name? It was in The Hobbit. Um, can't remember. Oh, yeah, I know. But, um, but yeah. His face. <laughs> Le Leo, Leo, isn't it? His name's Le Leo. Um, can't remember his surname, but he was played a blinder in that football film. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, we're going off track, but what, so how, how is it, um, just for those of us that, that haven't experienced it. How is it rocking up on set and you've got like an iconic figure there from, you know, British film or American TV or whatever it might be? It, it, do they tend to be normal? Are they, do you, do you get some <clears throat> prima donnas? Yeah, everyone's, everyone's different, you know. Uh, everyone's completely different. So I've had some, some people that are, it's like you, your Insta friends, you know, and other people are a little bit more standoffish. So, um, but yeah, I worked with, talking of Reservoir Dogs, I worked with um, Steve Basimi, um, uh, Mr. Pink. So, and that was, uh, what was that, two years ago now? I did a American TV show called Miracle Workers. And uh, and Daniel Radcliffe as well, who's uh, obviously like Harry Potter. And, uh, and I just, I had a riot. It was awesome. So um, Dan's amazing to watch. He's one of these guys you ask about um, scripts and things like that. I think he's the sort of character actor or that that can literally, he has the, the skills. I mean, he's 20 years younger than me probably. So um, but he, I can imagine that he knows the entire script for the entire season, you know, mm. like, you know, not just, he doesn't just know that block of scenes that, I, I, you know, I, I reckon he's got that sort of brain that would just retain the entire thing, you know. As Steve Buscemi was um, too too cool for school, really. So he was pretty he was pretty laid back. He just ne he just nailed his part, and I was just like thinking, oh my god, like you know, it's it's like it's Steve Buscemi is like in one of my favorite movies, a Big Lebowski, you know. And oh like my that. god what a film one of yeah i love it classics yeah that's i mean i kind of yeah i yeah i'm i'm kind of a big fan of the dude but 
Yes, and, uh, massively. And um, I remember Steve Buscemi being interviewed. I don't know if it was a, a, if it was the film Meteor or Ast- the, the was. I can't remember. It was a film where they went up to an asteroid and they had to. They were drill. They were oil drillers and they had to drill into it to save the planet. It was. So, it, it might have been that. It might have been the um, Nicholas Cage one where the the, the Con-, Con Air. But the interviewer said, "So, Steve, um, you know, I bet you like really do a lot of research before these films, and you know, to get in in in, in into character and, and and learn the script." And he said, "Oh, oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, m- months." Mumps and <laughs> you not give a mumps. You not give a mumps. No, you so can tell it, it just well, depends on the project and the, how big you are as an actor. I suppose you know it's like some people would be um, tied in months before, but it, it doesn't happen often. But it has it has happened to me um, recently. I've been tied into a, a couple of films uh, that don't start filming for like eighteen months. It's you know. So, you know, they're really, you know, they, my name's tied to the production and, it, you know, but this is really, really early on in, in pre-production. But the, the thing is, it's like, if you, if, well, if I was to invest a lot of my time in researching the character and blah, 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 like by the time we get to filming, you know, the, the script might have changed and the character might have changed anyway. So you have to just be versatile. And, and just be able to just just crack on with whatever because it's like um, I've you know I've I've done that before spent loads of time learning the lines like you know and stressing out about a huge block of dialogue that I've got like even the night before the shoot and I'm like I'm still not off book but and you kind of panic but as soon as you get on set and you're there it's like you realise that you've you've gone through it so many times it's in your muscle memory mm. so. Um, as in your mental memory. So, you know, and um, I used to be a, a drum teacher. So, and uh, if there was a certain rhythm or a certain song, I'd, you know, I'd say that you, you've got to play it at least 36 times to lodge it, lodge it in your muscle memory before you can then, you know, so, and I, I use, I use that as a, as a, as a guide to learning scripts as well. It's like, uh, you know, it's like, so I, I know I'm not, you know, lodging it in my actual muscles and lodging it in my brain. But then some of the, the scenes might be physical. So you've got movement to go with that as well. And, you know, so, which is another thing on top of talking, you've got to move. It's like, what? You know, it's like, but uh, especially with like complicated fight scenes with dialogue in between, you've got a lot to remember. Mm. So, and uh, on that, I forgot the original question. <laughs> yeah, no, I was going to come on to what, what's it actually like being on set? And I guess different productions have a different budget and a different sort of standard of um, um, comfort or VIP service. What, what, can you give us an idea about that? I mean, do you, do you just, just would, I don't know, would, oh, oh by the way, guys, it, 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 Leo Gregory um, would love to chat with him on the podcast. And it was Elijah Wood were the names, my uh, grey man. Yeah, that's it. Searching. <laughs> yeah, I had the same problem. I could see his face. I, 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 I love Elijah Wood's work, but uh, yeah, we're, we're talking about so much. It's like yes. other things get pushed out your brain. I'm yes. like Homer Simpson. You push one bit of info in, it pushes something else out. So, you know. I mean, I'll give you a, like an example. My friend was was starred, not starred, but he had a role in um, Saving Private Ryan. Right. And I was chatting to him and he said one of the, like the leading act, you know, one of the ones the camera's on, or he's, he said he was, just high on coke all all the time that and i just get this image of like what do you have like your trailer is this <laughs> is this guy going this back having a beer snorting a few lines you know reading it what just how does yeah, it yeah I've, I've not I've, I've been on over 150 sets and uh and i've never seen cocaine on the on the you know lifts of craft services like you know you'd be lucky if you get like uh uh, a decent sandwich, decent cup of coffee, you know. No, the catering's fantastic on on movies. Like you know, I don't work for the pay; I just work for the food, you know. But uh, yeah, but but personally, I'm not, I'm not a coke user, <clears throat> so that wouldn't excite me. 
um, it would it would it would amuse me. So, yeah, well, we had the producer of um, Dukes of Hazard on the show. Yeah, it's one of my favourite series as a kid. Yeah, I love that. It's great. Yeah. And but it all came out that a lot of that went on with the cast and crew. It, you don't realise that when you was it ten years old or something. You used to yeah, I've no doubt. I mean, the thing is, um, American productions that that some of their you know their shooting regimes are brutal, <clears throat> so you need something to to keep you awake. So I suppose that's just you know some people's weapon of choice, but not mm. mine personally. But what, I mean, what, they could what? you know work in like seventeen hours, you know. So what do you do? Do you have like a like a cafe is i mean if you're in the middle of nowhere do they bring a caravan yeah or? yeah so they'll bring like uh craft services like a coffee truck and stuff like that so and i don't have um caffeine um much at all so i'll have um you know two or three cups of tea a week um and stuff like that so if i need it i'll, I'll have like um you know a, a really good coffee from the coffee truck and it'll work, you know, because I don't do caffeine. So well, um, why don't you do caffeine? That sounds, uh, it's just a life, just a lifestyle choice. You know, it's like, um, I know I, it's, it, but it's good to know because I don't do it when I actually do need to pick me up. Mm. Coffee just literally sends me through the roof. Yeah. <clears throat> so, which is great. So, cause I did a shoot in um, Milan this year and their coffee over there is crazy. Uh, I'd ask for a, a, a shot of coffee and they'd bring me over a little cup with like that much in it. And I'm like, what's that? It's like, you know, but that's how they drink it. So, but I, I wanted to, I like to quaff things, you know, it's like, so I, I want to actually be able to go with a coffee rather than like, Boop. and uh, so I'd be, I'd be having four of these shots and they were looking at me like I was crazy. And that is like, you know, and they were like, each one of those shots is like, has four cups worth of caffeine in it it's mm. like super strong espresso stuff so but um, but the, the you know the shooting days were like 18 hours and it's like you've still if you've got to maintain a level of um you know b- performance and energy you know when you might have been filming at like 6 a.m and then it's like it's it's like you know 9 p.m at night and you still got to perform with that it's same you know, energy is that's it's tricky, and that's 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 why I don't. One of the reasons why I don't do caffeine, so I can guarantee that it works, and it keeps me from sniffing all that free coke. You know, <laughs> that's always kicking around on film sets. That's yeah. that's a joke. That's a joke. By the way, yes, got you, got you. It, it, <laughs> Just in case. No, I mean yeah. this is the, this is the thing about the modern day, as opposed to probably the seventies or whatever. Is 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 artists are in. in incredibly professional aren't they they have to be to survive i mean you you it's a bit like all the old dance djs the the ones that survive the ones that kept going from you know summer of love in 89 and are still going today they're the all the ones that knocks it all on the head yeah you know because you you you, you can't you can't function you know you can't function as a professional you can't you can for a honeymoon period and then it all it all um, starts going wrong, as um, my buddy Brandon Block would would uh, would uh, back me up on. We've gone a bit peak, Tom. Yeah, exactly. Yes, <laughs> yes. No, I mean, you know, I've seen I've seen some amusing things on set, but personally, I like to um, stay sharp. You know, so caffeine caffeine's my dirty drug mm-hmm. when I'm when I'm on on a film set, and that's about it. Like you know, maybe maybe an occasional biscuit. So Fisherman's Sorry. Friends and uh, just another great great film filmed in Cornwall. Um, I did have I was looking at the the um. So this chap, he's he's made a bit of a name. Daniel Mays, isn't it? Has made a bit of a name. For yeah, him. He, yeah, he, yeah. He's a good guy actually. He was fun to work with. Yes, and there you are alongside him on our imdb that that's a great that's a that's just that's just brilliant yeah i love it i, I love it I, I like um imdb is weird because it's like top of the pops so uh you your world ranking goes up 
or down, depending on like their logarithms, how many times you were clicked on on IMDb or how many times you, your name was typed into Google. Mm-hmm. So uh, every Monday they reset the charts and you either get a like um, a little green box at the top of your name or a little red box, depending on whether you've gone up or down. So I oh, do wow. sadly look at that. And, uh, and you can tell when a production is looking at you um, because your IMDb, IMDb ranking goes through the roof one week. Like, and you're like, oh, I've gone up like 25,000 in a week, which is unprecedented. And you're like, well, that means something's coming because there's numerous people on the production constantly looking at you or typing your name in on the internet, see what your internet presence is and stuff like that. So that's happened to me this week, actually. So something, this is something big that this so week comes. <laughs> after after I have my star, my, my, I almost said starring role then, but it is to me, my role in um, Martin's next film. Can I, can I have an eye? Can I have yeah, of course you can, man. Of course you can. This, is, this, this could be the start of another journey for you. You could have been in uh, Penitent. You would have played one of my boys perfectly, mate. It would, yes. have, it would have been great. So, yes. and the thing is, you've got a you've got a military experience, and I think part of the uh, the joy or of, of of penitent and part of the the realism is the fact that fifty um, percent of those people that were you know playing the squaddies and stuff like that, you know, were military ex military. So they added an element of realism. And Martin was very, um, very sure of what he wanted. Like you know, for instance, the uh, the actual um, machine gun sounds and and stuff like that. You know, mm-hmm. so the you know the gunfire sounds were yes. real. Uh, so they weren't Hollywood sounds. So the Hollywood uh, gunfire sounds. I mean, you know yourself, uh, they don't sound like you know that that real that that pop and like ping when you get like, pew! but it, you know, they, but that real guns, real gunfire doesn't sound interesting enough, you know, to be in Hollywood movies. Yes. But, but Martin wanted real gunfire sounds. So you, that's, that's what you've got on Pendleton. I really liked yeah. I really liked that attention to detail for it. It's great. I didn't like to but, tell him that when I do, um, my editing i i just i just download them off the net and they're really good <laughs> i know martin went to an actual rifle range didn't he and they recorded yeah. it and they got the but 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 uh, when i'm doing an overlay for uh, i can't think what what have i done now like say i'm i'm chatting to someone who's been in the falklands and you might be able to get some some fo- you you can get some footage from somewhere but it's not you know there's like a shot going off here a shot you can actually download machine gun and get it in here yeah. and you can get some lights flashing on it. And, it, and it, it's just incredible what you can do now. Um, yes. Just amazing. And also, um, what was I going to say? Um, I chatted to Lee is um, Lee, the guy that did all the music. Yeah. Is it Lee Groves? Yeah, Lee Groves. We had a great chat the other day. Um, incredible soundtrack. But we're getting off the topic. We're talking about Fishman's Friends, weren't we? Yeah, yeah. We keep, we keep, we were, uh, we keep getting back to it. Did back they have any the... in that pub? Was that real beer? Or... No, no. So I think I've only, I think I've only done one shoot where that, that you know, um, the the taps were live, as in they had live taps which was really interesting. So, and they was, they were saying, oh, the taps are live. They got real beer because they kept handing out like fake beer in, in the bottles and stuff. And some people were taking advantage of it. And, uh, and they were saying, oh, Jules, just like, you know, cause it was a real banging scene as well. And, uh, and this was on uh, fortitude actually, uh, the TV show. So I did a couple of seasons of that. And then, then somebody was like, oh, my God, they've actually got real beer in, in the pumps, you know? So some people were getting pissed, but it was one of those jump around, moshy scenes. It was quite funny anyway. And uh, so it was good to keep the energy up. But I, was, I had to drive back to, you know, Devon at the time. And uh, I was like, I'm not drinking that stuff because the uh, the fake stuff really makes you burp. It's horrible. It tastes disgusting. And it's just like, and it's really, really gassy. So it's like... Uh, 
you know. But uh, but yeah, it would be nice. But that's what uh, after parties are for. So, uh, but uh, but me and Daniel sunk a few at the um, at the uh, after party for uh, the premiere actually for Fisherman's Friends. So it was down here. They had um, they had the boss of uh, St Austell Breweries down for the premiere, and he had uh, I think it was tribute tribute like, yeah. on on t- on tap. So it was all all free. So that was some of the best food as well that I'd had at a rat pie ever because it was all local produced, you know, like really artisan, like fish and chips and stuff like that. They had real, real pasties and that stuff. So it was absolutely phenomenal. Like, you know, just um, good traditional Cornish food at a uh, premiere. So, and uh, yeah, me, me and Danny um, shared a few pasties and shared a few beers. So I was introduced to the boss of St. Ossel, um Breweries like, earlier on. And uh, like you know, prior to the premiere and stuff like that. So, and he, he he'd laid on free tribute for the for the night, basically as as much as we could drink. And then then later on, I stood at the bar, um, uh, having another pint of tribute. I'd had a few by then, and there was a guy um, ordering, you know, other other beers and bits and pieces. And I was like, why are you spending all that money? I'm like, you could just drink tribute. It's completely free. And he went, uh, no, not to me, it isn't. I'm, I own the breweries. And it was, this, it was the same bloke that I'd been introduced to earlier as the boss of St. Austin Breweries. And I was telling him to stop buying drinks, just drink, drink that stuff because it's free. Like, you know, but I, I managed to blag it and went, yeah, of course. I know, I know you are. You, I was introduced to you earlier because it suddenly clicked in. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> he was introducing me earlier, so and I went, "Yeah, I was just, I was just joking, mate. I know you are." And mm. He was like, "Yeah," and then I, I turned around to with my other probably two pints of tribute, and just uh, waddled off. And then I got um, an amazing hit thing happened because they, the the actual band Fisherman's Friends were there, so and they were they were singing for us. It was absolutely phenomenal. So two of the guys in the scene with me that are sat at the table with me before I get up to to try and fight Jago. Uh, they, uh, they're actually two of the guys from the band. So, so they weren't actors. It was fantastic. So I was having a good crack with them. But um, then one of the producers said, oh, we've got uh, some of the actors here. Can we get, the, get them on stage singing with the Fisherman's Friends? So, so me and Danny and a, a few others that were there, we ended up on stage, you know, singing to two or three of their songs. And we kind of, you know, picked up. Um, I was listening to the soundtrack in my car for a while. It was absolutely fantastic. One of their albums, or two of their albums, actually. And uh, because I, you know, it's it's one of those things. That I didn't do much filming on it, but I just be, I just really loved the idea that the fact that there's something to Port Isaac that isn't just uh, Dot Mine, you know. So, uh, but yeah, I, re- I really enjoyed it. It was. Re- I'm just gutted that I've never seen any of the videos because people were recording on their phones of me singing oh. with Fisherman's Friends. That would have been great. They're out there somewhere. But I've never seen them, you know. I had my first ever childhood holiday in Port Isaac. Yeah. Yeah, my friend's family booked a, like a room down or, a, you know, what, booked something down, but a little cottage or something. And, and might, uh, have been, might have been Dot Mines cottage. Yeah, well, possibly. Affordable, I, then. <laughs> I do remember there was a sign over a road and it said, this is the, I think it was the nar- narrowest road in the UK. Yeah. It's this tiny little road. I think maybe you can get a bicycle down or something. Uh, logistically, it's, it's bloody crazy filming in Port Isaac, especially when you're filming Dot Mine, because um, there's so many fans of the show. I mean, you know, it's been going for years. I think I've been working on it now for a decade. Um so, and and you, you're trying to get you, you you know your your unit cars down through these tiny little streets, and there's hundreds of people just lining the streets, just hoping to get a glimpse of you know uh, of Doc, you know, you know of Martin, and uh, yeah, it's um, it's weird. So I, I you know they're and they're all filming and stuff like that. So if I'm ever working on it, I go out and film the crowd. And I'm like, you know, how do you like it then? You know, what's so, uh, what's it like working with Martin Clunes then? He's a riot. 
Yeah. Um, he's got a really good sense of humor. And, uh, and the thing is, it's, it's his show, isn't it? So it's like, um, so it's, it's just another day at the office for him. He's, he's just so laid back. So there was a, there's a scene once where I find, uh, uh, you know, a really ill person on the beach and I'm, I'm, I drag him up to the, you know, the, the doc's house and it's really early in the morning because I'm a, I'm a fisherman in the show and uh fisherman Tom. So, so I'm, I'm knocking on his door to, to wake him up and he's, he's got a dressing gown and pajamas on like, you know, whatever, because it's really early. So, uh, so there, so there's one scene that I think uh, the first time I knocked on the door, he literally opened the door and he had his dressing gown. He just went, we're morning. And I'm, <laughs> <laughs> and it just put me off so much that I fluffed my lines on the next take. So I had a brain fart because I was expecting him to do something stupid. So, um, <laughs> so that was that. So I remember him saying to me, um, cause I fluffed, I didn't, I, I still got my lines out, but I, I was literally having a, having a moment. So I was stuttering my lines. So they, they were kind of stammered and they weren't at the pace that they were meant to be. And I remember going, yes, Jules, uh, just like that, but faster. And I went, what's well, your fault? Like, I was expecting you to do something stupid. You just flashed me, <laughs> you know? It's like, so and what else did he do? There's another scene in a doctor's surgery where we had a real baby on set, like swaddled, and he, he doesn't like babies. So, uh, and then, but the baby could only work for X amount of time because he's a baby and they got really strict rules with how long a baby can, can be on set for, like a, I think it might be something crazy, like half an hour, which is completely fair. And uh, so for the rest of the time, you know, because the scenes take a long time, they they had one of these fake babies that look quite disturbingly real. I don't like them. They're creepy. So uh, so they've got a fake baby wrapped up. And they, these things, these fake babies are worth thousands and thousands of pounds because they, they do look real, you know, that obviously they're made for the film industry and, and everything else. So they, they cost a lot, a lot of money. So there's a there's just a bit where I think he'd just done enough and he's got he's got a, a quirky sense of humor. So and at one point, like um I'm I I say, I'll I'll take the baby. Like because he's he doesn't want to be left with it, you know, and he's he's asking and he and he just kind of looks at me because I'm wearing all my fishman stuff, and he's like, No, you know, but then as they went cut. He, he literally threw the baby at me over his shoulder, and I'm like, "Whoa!" So, like, and it's just, just stupid stuff. So he's, um, yeah, he's a good laugh to work with, and a good laugh to drink with afterwards at the at the season wrap parties. So more free tribute, I think. Yes, and um, Exile, isn't it? That that's that's yep. going to be Martin's upcoming. Yeah, we're working on that like, currently. So yeah, that's uh, that's good. So as a what role have you got in that? I, <laughs> so I'm playing El Diablo. So so basically, I'm I'm playing Lucifer. Oh wow! Oh, the it's ginger that version. It's that deep, is it? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I'm apparently I'm playing someone dying on the battlefield. Well, it's, oh. it's, it's, well we won't won't be me, me killing you, but I could make an appearance. Yes. So. Oh my gosh. So is that is that your upcoming project, or have you got more to do? Oh well, there's lots um, coming up for me. So, um, but yeah, we're we're working on that. I don't know when my scenes will be. Probably not till next year now. But um, but we'll see. It, it depends on the mood and stuff like that because um, a lot of the scenes are outdoors, and uh, we're not afraid of a bit of weather down here. So so it all depends on. Uh, you know, whether he wants, whether he wants sunshine or cloud or whatever, because we're approaching, you know, it's, it's autumn now, sadly. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, that that's upcoming, but I've got some other bits and pieces that I'm kind of not, not allowed to talk about. And some, I've, yeah, a big uh, Hollywood thing just um, contacted me to say that I'm, I'm penciled, which basically means I could have it or I might not have it. So I've auditioned and uh, and they could I could literally have a message on my phone now saying, Oh, you've got the job, or you might have a meeting with the director, or you've been released. Normally, when you're penciled 
for a big product like that, it means they've got two people that they really like and they're like the, you know, all the decision makers are, are making a decision, but it's, it's exciting to get uh, penciled uh, for a production, but I don't get excited really until I'm in the costume. I'm on the set and I hear the words action. That's when I really go, Oh, this is real now, you know? Uh, got you. So, so I, I try, I try not to think about stuff like like that or get excited it's like i do my auditions i do my work and uh you know i have my projects that i'm signed to that are up and coming but uh, there's a lot of logistical things that could go wrong between this stage in the journey and that stage where i'm in costume with other actors and we're gonna make something it's mm -hmm. like you know so i'm pretty laid back because you have to be because this uh, industry has a huge amount of rejection in it you know so you have to you have to learn uh, to deal with rejection and also be deal with being kicked in the bollocks, you know, because it does that a lot as well. You know, you could you could get some thing and then get, you know, that the product the, the production might get cut, you might get cut. You know, it's like you can't feel precious about anything because you don't own the words that were written, and you don't own the character. All you can do is do the best job you can and hope that you make the final cut. You know, so there's been a, a few uh, projects I've done that where I haven't. So we, so you invest time and uh, you know, and and you know, emotional stuff with with your performances and your delivery. But at the end of the day, I'm just an actor. I don't I don't own anything. I just hope that my performance is good enough to make that final cut, and that I'm I'm, um, you know, an important part of whatever the story is that we're telling have you spent much time in hollywood is that yeah i was i was in la uh, pre-covid actually and uh and i came back because i was nervous of uh healthcare costs uh of over there because i i had like um so i was in los angeles for like three months and i only had three months of um healthcare cover and then when covid hit <clears throat> and uh I was over there and getting quotes for extending healthcare cover. And I just thought, no, nah, I think this is serious now. It's going to shut down the whole film system, which it did. So I decided to come back um, to the UK because we have the fantastic NHS, uh, you know, which doesn't cost you $3 million if you become ill, you know, and, and go into hospital for a week. You know, it's, uh, so as much as we... Um, uh, you know, the, the British public feel about the nhs it's only when you're in another country without it that you realize it's actually really really important and it's a, it's a privilege to have you know it's mm. like you know and we should support it a lot more than uh, i think we do you know because i think a lot of, a lot of brits take it for granted you yeah. know um but we gotta, you know, we gotta preserve it at all costs you know everyone should have um yeah you know the right right to health healthcare in, in a yeah, i think it's about 15 15 grand uh a year for healthcare in the states or something mm. so i mean don't don't quote me on that but that was that was the sort of prices i was getting quoted um and and you know and when you if you know there might be a time when you you know you have periods of um with my work it's it's a famine or feast and if if you're on famine you might not have 15 grand kicking around just to pay out for you know an insurance you know, that's what all it is it's uh, health insurance it's weird having to deal with insurance brokers in in the states as well um to sell your health care it's like we're used to it with car insurance and house insurance and all that stuff but but insurance brokers for your health it's quite surreal you know uh, they have different levels of cover as well you know it's like so you have like bronze silver uh, gold platinum and it's uh, it's just it's crazy that you have to make those decisions based on what might happen to you with your health or your family or, or whatever, you know? So, um, exactly. so yeah. So, so yeah, I've, I, I love it. Um, over there. I love the States. Um, but I'm not in a rush to go anywhere right now with the state of, um, you know, COVID. I know, we, I know we don't particularly want to discuss it, but it has affected everything. Uh, you know, I'm working in the film industry under, you know, 
uh, during COVID and having a dedicated COVID team and having to have two COVID tests uh, a week and everyone's like faced up and they're spraying everything with crazy chemical that that lasts for, it, you know, it kills the germs. You know, they're, they're spraying floors, ceilings, door handles, everything. Um, on, on Vikings, I think they were they were spraying this, this thing, spraying the whole offices and and sets and stuff. I think they were spraying it once a fortnight, a load of chemical lasted uh, a month, you know, so they're, they're being ultra, ultra careful. But it makes, it did make at the time, you know, the really big crowd scenes quite unnerving um, because all of the actors are, are being like really careful and stuff like that. But, you, you know, uh, you don't know if like the 300 extras are being careful as well. You know, it's like, or what, or what they're doing when they're not working, when they're not working, you know, uh, and stuff like that. So it was, it was quite unnerving. It's okay on the smaller scenes because we all the actors knew each other. We were, we were one bubble, you know? So yeah, we knew like that. that we were taking our tests and taking and in being really careful. I mean, we weren't allowed to meet in groups of more than six, I think. So, you know, so all the protection was put in place and even in taxis, um, so we all had to have masks on. We weren't let to weren't let to sit next to each other or anything like that. It was um, very surreal um, filming experience. Yes, I bet. Jules, listen, this has been absolutely fascinating. Thanks so much for coming on the show and um, enlightening us all to uh, both your skills and and experiences and and the acting world in general. Um, I look forward to seeing you at some point in the future. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're not a million miles away. No, 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 we're not. So we pr- might catch up for a social, but I'm sure me, you and Martin between between now and um, now and exile. No, I'm always um, up for that. Always up but, for that. Um, I, I can give you some tips on how to play a dying man or a, or a corpse. Please do. <laughs> yes, I'm a lifelong <laughs> learner. I, 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 I'll um, be very pleased about that. Mate, this could open new doors for you. Mm. It's like, you know, it's, oh, well, it's like... well, I have, you know, I did hear Brad Pitt is um he's a bit unnerved now. And that's really weird that you should uh you should uh that you should mention that because I just had him in my head. <laughs> there you like, go. So uh, because I was uh, th- I was thinking uh, about um the first big Hollywood thing I did was with Brad Brad Pitt. So I was thinking about that when you said his name. So uh, we've already got that spiritual connection going on there, so you know, it's, fantastic. It's gonna be good. So, all right, Chris, it's lovely to meet you, mate. Yeah, stay on the line so I can just thank you properly when I hit the record off. But Jules, wish you all the success in the world, and thank you for your um, commitment to the craft. Um, for for film lovers like me, it's it's um, yeah, it's one of the one of the good things in my life. We'll put your social media below the video, so um. If you just want to send me that, I know we're on Twitter together. Um, and come back and tell us how Vikings Valhalla works out. That that's uh, I look forward to watching that. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited. I'm hoping it's early 2022. I think everyone is. They've already put a teaser uh, thing saying coming soon on Netflix. So oh, they've already brilliant. put a teaser trailer on there. So just to generate excitement. And um, I've seen um, uh, a fair bit of the footage because I had to go in and do some... Um, uh, ADR, which is you know uh, some of the voice work for for their accent scenes and stuff on the boats where they couldn't quite pick up the dialogue. So I've seen the scenes; they look fucking amazing. <laughs> so it's uh, I think uh, people are really going to love it. Excellent, excellent. And to all our friends at home, please look after yourselves. Uh, if you can like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. Share this video. Uh, Much love to you all and we'll see you soon.